Hi, I'm Tom, W8JI, and I'd uh, like to talk to you a little bit about antennas and how and why antennas radiate and and uh, what's important and what isn't important in understanding uh, uh, the mechanisms behind uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation. There are three distinct fields or forces involved in an antenna. There's the electric or the electric induction field, uh, sometimes represented by D. There's the magnetic field or the magnetic induction field, represented by H. And then there's the electromagnetic or the radiation field that we use to communicate with each other. Um, and that's the one that's important to us. The other two fields, the local electric field and the local magnetic field, are just real short distance things. There's a few things that we just cannot do that we sometimes think we can or people tell us we can. We can't communicate across any real distance of space uh, with the magnetic fields. Uh, we can't do this receiving, we can't do this transmitting. Uh, number two, we can't communicate across any real distance of space with the electric fields. We can't do that receiving, we can't do that transmitting. The propagation that we have, the communications we have over a long distance is with electromagnetic radiation. We can't mix those other two local induction fields and, and magically create electromagnetic radiation. The electromagnetic ra radiation comes from charge acceleration in the conductors of our antenna and it's a function of the current we have distributed over a linear length of space. Now if this is a real long length of uh, uh, antenna then we can consider all these little individual sections of current uh, distributed across space and how those individual sections of current either add together in phase or subtract from each other out of phase and, and then eventually form the overall pattern of the antenna. But basically it's just the current across a given linear straight in line beeline length of space that causes the radiation and we can't cheat that. Now the electric and magnetic induction fields are very strong forces locally right around the antenna within say a half wavelength or a wavelength of the antenna depends a little bit on the exact size of the antenna but they're fairly local if the antenna is real small they pretty well the effects of them start to go away within a eighth wavelength or so of the antenna um, these uh, fields these uh, local induction fields can't be used for long distance transmission or reception they can't travel far they get weak very fast they're mostly a geometry problem with the size of the antenna and how far apart the charges are on the antenna or how something real close to the antenna sees charges moving in the antenna. The electric and magnetic induction fields are a local force. They're not a long distance force. If you have a magnetic loop or any kind of loop antenna and you think your loop antenna is receiving magnetic waves from a long distance away, you're just wrong. The electric induction field is a force on other local charges caused by the uneven distribution of charges in our antenna or the potential difference along the antenna. Uh, this, the electric induction field is responsible for displacement currents that, that flow from the antenna or they fringe off the end of the antenna uh, that create the end effect where our open-ended antennas like dipoles, for example, are electrically a little bit longer uh, than the physical length of the wire. Um, and this electric field is not static or noise or RFI, uh, but it can cause or create or couple to other local things. It's not necessarily the only local coupling mechanism. The other local field that uh, couples to things uh, very strongly around the antenna in the Im immediate vicinity of the antenna is of course the magnetic induction field. The magnetic induction field is, is a strong local field 
the magnetic induction field, just like the local electric field, is primarily an energy storage or a very localized field. The magnetic induction field is not responsible for transmission or reception over any significant distance. The magnetic induction field is from current flowing. It's just from charge movement. It isn't from charge acceleration. Okay, the field that's of primary interest to us, or the force or the effect that that we're interested in as in long as long distance communicators is the electromagnetic radiation. The electromagnetic field is caused by charge acceleration. The electromagnetic field is a very weak local force. It's really not a strong force at all. The electromagnetic field, however, goes on forever unless something absorbs it or cancels it. Um, this is why it allows us to to communicate at large distances with a low, relatively low amount of power. When a, a charge accelerates, all the other charges in the universe feel that force and adjust accordingly. That is, unless something, of course, uh, absorbs it or cancels it in between. This is why uh, radio and antennas are just magic, and even relatively inefficient antennas will sometimes surprise us with a long distance uh, contact. Uh, even at low power. So uh, the very strong local forces are just something we live with uh, locally. We can say we have a magnetic loop and we can say we have a voltage probe uh, type of antenna but what these antennas are actually receiving is electromagnetic radiation. It isn't just the magnetic field, it isn't just the electric field. Antennas will radiate all of the applied RF power, less the power converted to heat. We usually consider this as two resistances sharing transmitter or receiver power. We call the good resistance the radiation resistance and the bad resistance the loss resistance. Radiation resistance, by proper useful definition, is the total power radiated in the electromagnetic field divided by the square of the effective current that caused the radiation. Loss resistance is a dissipative resistance normalized to the very same area or point where we take current to determine radiation resistance. It's critical that we take the loss resistance and the radiation resistance exactly the same way. It has to be at the same point. We have to use the same methods. Otherwise, we're mixing apples and oranges, and the loss resistance doesn't necessarily work as a comparison, as a direct comparison to radiation resistance. So when I grew up, um, and I would talk to the older local hams and stuff like that, uh, read books, I read a lot of uh, uh, books uh, from when I started in ham radio, and there were some golden rules that I kept hearing over and over and over again. And these golden rules were to get the high current area of the antenna up in the clear. Uh, to keep the high current areas as straight as possible. And to not fold the antenna back more than 90 degrees even at the ends where the current was low. Um, I also heard, and I'm sure everybody else has heard, uh, that end loading or top loading is the best way to load an antenna and that a very good method of loading an antenna is use capacitance hats at the antenna open ends. So let's look and see if, it, if these rules make sense or if that was just something that people were just saying that they really uh, didn't know. So why all the concern about uh, current? Well uh, the net or effective current distributed over a direct inline distance across space is what causes electromagnetic radiation. And to radiate a given amount of power as electromagnetic radiation, we have to have a certain amount of net or effective current in a conductor over a given inline distance in wavelength across space. This isn't how much we ball up and put in one little tiny spot. 
This is the A to B space that the antenna occupies. And for a given frequency, we can call that the ampere feet or the current over that inline distance. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ampere feet and what ampere feet is. Um, and this ties into radiation resistance. I'll make a connection between those two. Hopefully it'll be understandable. The, um, uh, the ampere feet is the average or the effective uh, current or the current integrated over a distance across space that's in line from point A to point B. The ampere feet depends on the length in wavelengths and the actual power radiated. I'm going to use an example antenna and go through some different current distributions in the antenna and, and uh, this will probably highlight some of the misunderstandings that people have when they try to make more efficient small antennas. Well, let's start with a small uh, dipole antenna, a tenth of a wavelength long, so it's not, um, it's not a very long, a long antenna, and we'll have uniform cross-section and a relatively thin antenna. This will give us a triangular current distribution where the current starts out highest in the center and it tapers in a straight line down to nearly zero. We're just going to call it zero because it's so close to zero out at the tips of the antenna. And so now let's, let's consider that we're going to radiate 100 watts of power. Well, in, our earlier, um, in my earlier comments, I said that the radiation resistance was the uh, total power radiated divided by the square of the current that caused that radiation. So we can do this and we'll consider on any frequency, any frequency at all, an antenna a tenth of a wavelength long. The, if, if it has triangular current distribution, the current in the center is going to be about 7.2 amperes to radiate 100 watts of electromagnetic energy. And of course halfway out each direction from the center it's going to be 3.6 amperes. So this will radiate 100 watts. If we take the radiation resistance at the center of the antenna then the radiation resistance of this antenna is going to be 100 divided by 7.2 squared or 1.93 ohms. This will be for any frequency um, that this antenna is on because the antenna is, we defined it as a tenth of a wavelength long, center fed, and we also defined that it's going to radiate 100 watts of, of electromagnetic energy. So now what happens to this very same antenna that's a tenth of a wavelength long if we do some kind of uh, trick in the configuration of the antenna so that we can get current to flow all the way out to the very ends of the antenna? And let's say we can make this antenna so the current is almost uniform. For all practical purposes, we'll make the current uh, uniform. Say we'll use some large hats or something out at the end of the antenna and end load it. And again, we're considering that this is just a lossless antenna because we're only interested in making the current as low as possible over the length of the antenna to radiate 100 watts. Because if we make the current low, then the amount of power dissipated in any loss resistances will also be minimized. It goes down by the square of the current reduction. So anything we do to reduce the current that we have to have to cause the radiation will help make the antenna more efficient. So if we do that and we have a distribution that's, that's almost uniform across the length of the antenna, say 3.68 amperes in the center of the antenna tapering to 3.5 amperes at the ends of the antenna. Now we can do our magical radiation resistance formula and we can find that 100 watts of radiated power uh, divided by the 3.68 amperes in the center squared we come up with 7.4 ohms. This is almost four times the radiation resistance of the triangular distribution antenna and the antennas are exactly the same length. So now we made the current half as much so if the loss resistances 
are the same resistive value and we've cut the current in in half in the antenna then we've reduced the losses in the antenna by four times so the antenna is a whole lot more efficient because we've pulled the current down to half of what it was and we've done this by making the current flat over the length of the antenna so changing the distribution of current across the given uh, distance of space changes the radiation resistance because it changes the ampere feet across that uh, linear beeline distance of space between point A and point B. So let's not make any mistake about it though. When we shorten or load an antenna, no matter how we do it, if we pack a hundred feet of wire in a two foot distance, no matter how we pack it, it's just going to be a two foot antenna. We can run the wire in a straight line. It's a, if uh, in this consideration we're going to just say it's a two foot long uh, space from uh, A to B. Um, and if we pack a uh, hundred feet of wire in there by coiling it, it's still a two foot long antenna. If we fold it up in uh, zigzags or fractals or anything we want to fold, any kind of magical uh, geometry we want to fold the wire up in, as long as the occupied space is a tiny fraction of a wavelength, that's what the antenna is. I'm going to prove to you that we can't get an advantage uh, by packing more wire into a small space with a couple other examples. Okay, so you wonder, you might wonder how I made this antenna that I showed a little bit uh, earlier here, the tenth of a wavelength long antenna that had almost uniform distribution. Well, that actually came from an easy neck model, and what I did is I modeled a, cr a couple great big uh, capacitance hats at each end of the uh, antenna, and then uh, I got the current distribution from that uh, from that model, and it actually tracks quite well with uh, with uh, antenna theory. There's not any real um, uh, discrepancy at all between what you can do longhand on paper and what comes out of the easy neck model. So let's look at what happens if we do the same thing and now we do a, uh, a helix or a spiral um, and we have say uh, a few tenths of a wavelength of conductor packed into the same one tenth long, one tenth wavelength long space from A to B from one end of the antenna to the other end. Still a tenth of a wavelength long but now we packed a, a, a few tenths of a wavelength of wire in that area. What, what do you suppose will happen to this antenna as far as the current that we need to radiate the very same amount of power? What we find in that helical wound antenna, that spiral or helical wound antenna, that's a tenth of a wavelength long from point A to point B, and now we have over two tenths of a wavelength of wire uh, wound up in that area, we find that that same wire has an almost triangular current distribution. Uh, because the spatial length is still a tenth of a wavelength, and because the current distribution through that antenna is still almost triangular, the radiation resistance is about 2.2 ohms. It's 100 watts of radiated power divided by 6.7 amperes now causing the uh, radiation uh, 6.7 amperes squared uh, divided into um, 100 is uh, 2.23 ohms so we have roughly 2.23 ohms of radiation resistance if you model this antenna in easy neck and you look at the feed point resistance of the antenna easy neck uh, uh, comes out at 2.23 ohms this is why we have to be very careful with what we're doing with antennas and we just can't assume things. The, um, uh, because now we've got two tenths of a wavelength of wire so the current has to flow through over two tenths of a wavelength of conductor which means the resistance in that conductor went up but we didn't push the radiation resistance up to match. The radiation resistance stayed almost the same as if it was just a single linear conductor that that uh, uniform cross-section conductor straight in line 
that was only a tenth of a wavelength long. So we have no better current distribution over the area of the antenna. We don't really have significantly higher radiation resistance. It changed a little bit because we modified the loading of the antenna a little bit. But um, um, we es essentially have exactly the same thing. Very little change in radiation resistance, but now because look what we did. We have twice the length of, uh, of uh, conductor, over twice the length of conductor making up the antenna. So we've, we've increased the resistive losses in the antenna significantly without pushing the radiation resistance up. Thanks for uh, watching this. This tutorial is only intended to explain radiation and current distribution. As time permits, I'll go through examples of antennas that appear in various places including antennas that are completely mislabeled to be something that they are not. For example, a slot antenna, by definition, is a slot in a very large sheet. A slot antenna, by definition, is not a folded up loop or dipole, but rather current excited in a large sheet or cylinder by exciting voltage across a slot or valley. We also cannot helically wind a small loop a small monopole, or put three-quarter wavelength of wire on a four-foot CB antenna and have a three-quarter wave antenna. Thank you for watching this and uh, I hope to be able to do more of these.